Yeah. 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 Uh, Scarborough Town Council workshop on uh, tax increment financing, and we have Attorney Sean Mueller yeah. here, who will start off the presentation. And uh, do you want to do any introduction, yeah, just Tom? Quick, quick by way of introduction, uh, this council had a presentation and workshop actually with the developers of Scarborough Downs. Uh, as part of that conversation, they kind of foreshadowed uh, the fact that they will likely come forward with a request for some tax assistance through the tax increment financing vehicle. Um, those conversations have just begun, uh, so I think we're weeks, if not months, away from that being brought forward. Uh, but it made sense uh, because this is really kind of a complicated area to spend some time outside of the pressures of an actual proposal to understand what these are all about, and hopefully it will lay a good foundation for when and if that proposal comes forward. So tonight we have Shauna Cook Mueller from Bernstein Shore, who's really one of the statewide experts on TIFs. Uh, we're lucky enough to have her part of the Municipal uh, Law Team, uh, Bernstein Shore and, uh, at our disposal. Karen Martin, obviously, uh, is our local expert on the subject as well. So we'd like to walk you through a presentation. I think our, our goal would this for this to be interactive as possible. So feel free to ask questions as we go. I think uh, you may have many as we go forward, and to ask you to hold them all to the end is probably too much. So please uh, interject, ask a question as we go forward. So that's our goal for this evening. <coughs> And I do appreciate the early start. We just want to make sure we give this topic proper time and uh, for discussion. So, Shauna, you want to start? Right. Sure. Sure. Nice to see everybody. Um, I, I think I know most everybody at this point, but for, for those who may not remember, um, as Bernstein sure represents the town of Scarborough, we have some people who are specialists in certain areas of law. So my primary role here in Scarborough is working on your public finance bond issues and then as needed, tax increment financing. Um, and I represent municipalities all over the state on tax increment financing. I probably have at least eight to 10 projects, whether they're amendments or TIF districts or ongoing issues with TIF districts go, pro, going at any one time. So I definitely have a lot um, of experience in this over the last decade. And I'm giving these kinds of presentations, sort of the TIF 101 presentations to communities all the time because um, it is not common that a municipality is always in a TIF. You know, you're not thinking about it all the time. It comes up periodically. And so for elected officials, especially, to kind of really get into the weeds and understand the policy potential of this program, it's useful to, to go through this exercise. So certainly, as um, Tom said, uh, interrupt me with questions as we go to make this as useful as possible. Um, so to get started, I'm just going to um, describe what we're, we're planning to cover. So what is a TIF district and how do they work at the pretty basic level? Um, number two, we'll talk about types of districts because there are varying types. Number three, we'll talk about credit enhancement agreements and what the difference is between a TIF district and a credit enhancement agreement. Number four, we'll talk about how TIF revenues, once they're generated in a TIF district, are permitted to be spent. You know, what can we fund with TIF revenues? Um, number five, we'll talk about the tax shift benefit, which is um, a feature of main law in tax increment financing that impacts the municipality's financial incentive to create TIF districts. And then number six, um, Karen will get up and talk about the existing TIF districts um, of Chow Scarborough. Okay, so number one is what is a TIF district? This is pretty um, sort of broad level explanation here, but it's an economic development tool that allows municipalities to capture new property tax value. Um, so it's created, it's a function of state statute, but it's really an authorization to municipalities to create and designate TIF districts and develop their own programs to administer those. There is a state uh, review process, but it's really meant to be a municipality's program um, that's enabled by state law. Uh, so how they work is you set a geographic boundary around some area in the municipality. And we can talk about this later, but they don't actually have to be contiguous. You can have one TIF district that is property here and property there. 
Um, once you set that geographic boundary, it essentially freezes the assessed value in that boundary. And any property taxes paid on increased <coughs> assessed value in that area goes into what's called a development program fund or your TIF fund where your TIF revenues are kept. And those TIF revenues can only be spent on certain approved project costs, as they're called. Um, and those are defined in statute. We'll get to a description of what those are, but they're meant to be investments in economic development, as this is an economic development tool. Um, the can the districts can, yes, go ahead. Sorry, can I just interrupt? Can I just restate, just because I'm trying to follow up? The, the, so you're saying you freeze the assessed value yes. at a certain point in time, and then any growth in that assessed value, the tax revenue that would otherwise be paid goes into a fund. That's or, right. Or the tax revenue paid by the, by the property owner then goes into a special reserve fund. That's right. Yes, so at the time that a TIF district is established, there's already an assessed value, whether or not there's a building, right? There's, at least there's land value there. Um, although uh, there's an exception to that rule. But for the most part, TIF districts have, all have an original assessed value that is something more than zero. So for the term of the TIF district and beyond, at least the tax revenue on that existing value will continue to go to the general fund. Um, the exception to that is when you have um, property that's exempt from taxation, like a 501c3 organization that qualifies, or town-owned property that then gets sold. Um, so there are TIF districts with zero OAVs for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And just as a function of, um, of the definition section of the statute that defines original assessed value as the assessed value, the taxable assessed value as of a certain date, uh, zero can be the OAV original <coughs> value. So, um, so along with um, designating the actual physical boundaries of a TIF district, when a TIF district is designated, a development program document needs to be um, drafted and adopted by the legislative body of the community. And that's where you talk about your goals for the program, what you intend to do with the TIF revenue, and we'll get into some of those options as well. Um, I mentioned before that applications, after they are approved, after your district, TIF district is designated by um, the local government and the development program is adopted, then the application before it's actually a, dis a district, uh, an operational district, it needs to be approved at the state level. Their review is just for statutory compliance. Um, so they're not going to say this is a good idea or a bad idea. They're looking at it compared to the statute. Did you follow the process? Are the projects listed in the um, statute? And there are two types of um, TIF districts. Um, economic development TIF districts are reviewed by the main state, um, the, by the main Department of Economic and Community Development. And then there is a separate statute that governs um, housing, affordable housing TIFs, which you all have more recent experience with those types of TIFs here. And those are reviewed by the Minnesota Housing Authority, and DECD does not um, have involvement with those. I like to use this graphic when we're just sort of talking about how these things work. Um, you can see that the green bar represents the base value or what, I, what the statute calls original assessed value. So this assumes that that property had a million dollars of assessed value at the time the district was created. And then the white box, new $5 million of value, that is what we call sheltered or captured in the TIF district. And so the taxes paid on the $5 million of increased assessed value is what goes into the TIF fund and can only be used on project costs that are outlined in your development program document. Then the TIF ends at the end of, in this case, this example says 30 years. That's the maximum term of years any TIF district can last. At that time, all $6 million of assessed value goes on to the general fund tax rolls. Yes. How, do you, how do you recognize the end value? Mm -hmm. uh, is, it a, is it an arbitrary number that we assign? Like say we, if it's that $6 million, how do you know in 30 years it's going to be worth $6 million? 
You don't. You, so okay. it's just whatever the assessed value is as determined by your assessor at, at any given year, really. I got you. Okay. So you're really setting up just the structure, and then whatever actually happens on the property is going to dictate how much TIF revenue is generated, and then therefore at the end of the district, how much much general fund to revenue or to revenue is. Uh, so all the improvements over time go through the normal assessor department uh, analysis. A value is associated with that. A tax rate is then applied, and that generates a certain revenue stream that goes is sheltered that's for, the, right. for the length of the term. That's right. Yes. So the the um, regular tax assessment <coughs> and even the tax collection is the same. Um, as it would be for anyone else, in, whether they're in a TIF district or not. Um, it's really what happens to the tax revenue when it comes in to the municipality. Um, so, yeah. That's Just a, a final point. In the first instance, though, there is modeling and, and assumptions made in terms of what do we expect, uh, how will, the, will this perform over time? And that, there's been some challenges in some of our local examples they've underperformed based mm -hmm. on a number of factors, uh, external factors. There's all sorts of things that might affect performance over time. But in the first instance, you'll see performance based on expectations. This is what we think the value will be and when it will be realized. Is there any opportunity? So let's assume that we say a million now. In 30 years, it's less than a million. Uh, worst case scenario, do we have any rebate requirements or anything like that? Or they're just going to, that's the, they're going to be paying that minimal one million no matter what. If it goes below that, that's just what they're charged. No, so um, the taxpayer will pay property tax on whatever the assessed value is. So yes. if it turns out that over time the property actually loses value, they'll only be obligated to pay tax on 900000 or whatever okay. the assessed value is. Okay. Um, and, and I hate to do this, but the, the city of Stanford has a, a TIF district um, that was put in place at, that has lost value mm -hmm. just by timing in the marketplace. It's an area-wide district that encompassed a lot of property, which has <coughs> lost value over time. So it does happen, um, but you know it's very, very uncommon. Um, the one important piece is that no matter what, we're reimbursing only what what is being paid in. In other words, we're not paying forward on we're not paying more than somebody is paying in. And if our estimates are off, that's the risk of the, the developer if they've made that investment. Right. Um, and risk well, for us if we've Sean made mentioned the investment. It, but, but again, it's the normal process. The assessor assesses like they do any other property. We issue tax bills <clears> like we do in any property. The taxpayer actually pays their bill. Right. Depending on the arrangement, we may reimburse a portion back. Mm -hmm. But it happens just like any other property. If. Uh, if the green area is assessed as a million dollars at the beginning of the project and in 20 years you have all sorts of nice improvements made, then the land value is going to likely go up. Correct. Does that million dollars stay stable or does yes. it simply float with whatever the assessed value attributed to it? It's the assessed value as of a certain date. Right. So it'll be a historical, it'll be a number. So, it, so it's an historical number. It, Correct. You yeah. set it and then forget it. Right. If that million, do, if that piece of land that was worth a million dollars in 2018 and you start a TIF and it's suddenly worth, because you've added infrastructure, you've right. added other improvements, the value of the land may indeed go up, um, but that can be captured value. It's still based on the... Anything above dollars. the original assessed value is okay. sheltered or captured. And there's one exception to that rule also. Which is, <laughs> this is why we have an attorney. Well, this is the kind of thing that you that now um, we have the benefit of other people's experiences. But um, when a municipality undergoes a revaluation, that can result in what some might call sort of artificial increased assessed value on a particular property. And so in some cases, municipalities have reserved the right to, when they've undergone a revaluation, make some kind of adjustment to the way in which they're measuring their captured value. Um, so they don't all, all of a sudden, in a TIF district, capture a bunch of what's sort of like, just due to a revaluation, increased assessed value. Do, do the municipalities negotiate with the developer for what the uh, uh, base value of the project will be? There's no negotiation about what the base value of the pro property would be because that's a defined term. It's the assessed value of the property as of a certain date. 
So it's whatever it's on the assessor's book says. But if you are in fact negotiating a credit enhancement agreement with a developer where some portion of TIF revenue is reimbursed to the developer, um, you can negotiate that they, there's only reimbursement after they hit an additional higher threshold. There, that contract, there's a lot of flexibility in how that's structured. You can, um, that original assessed value for purposes of determining what it, this, the town can capture is a defined term in the statute. Can, can you just, for, I guess maybe my benefit obviously, can you define what you mean by sheltered <laughs> value? Yeah, so we'll kind of get to that later. Okay, I, I like I like having, the, the word probably should say captured because that's really what we're talking about right now. We're going to talk about sheltered revenue later and what that means with like, the tax shift benefit issue. Uh, yes? Yeah, the question, um, and Tom, you might want to chime in. Mm -hmm. So since this uh, kind of addresses the intervals in between the start and the end of the TIF, um, if I remember correctly, um, the developer can renegotiate the contract for the TIF if projections along the way do not meet the original projections. We had one of those, I think, in Scarborough ones. In fact, two of the existing ones had been right. renegotiated largely because they didn't perform. <coughs> the and therefore, the TIF could actually extend out beyond the original Correct. 30 years. Correct. Not, not beyond 30 years. But um, all can. The, a lot of TIF districts are set to start, uh, to, to terminate like 20 years or 15 years, and, and the town doesn't pick 30 years as the original term of years. So in some cases, it, you can always renegotiate a credit enhancement agreement. Um, so if the developers come in and ask for an adjustment, um, that can, so an extension of time can be part of Wasn't the property across from Cabela's where the new developments go? That was one of those. What was the, the other one? The other one was Enterprise Business Park. Enterprise, okay. Yeah. And, I, and Karen will talk about those specific okay. examples okay. later, too. Thank you. So. Okay, so this slide is meant to talk a little bit in general terms about what are the potential benefits that municipalities can receive from this program, using this program in a strategic way. Um, one is assisting the achieving economic development goals of a conference plan or other planning or vision document. So a lot of the approved project costs that are available for use under the TIF statute and can be funded with TIF revenues. Um, can allow you to realize some of those goals. Um, a lot of it's investment um, in infrastructure, um, but other, other types of things grow in your economic development programming. Um, the second one is attracting new investment. So um, attracting jobs, improving the local economy. I think this is really about making sure that in certain circumstances, if a developer comes and requests a credit enhancement agreement, there may be opportunities to, to really promote um, the economy through the use of a credit enhancement agreement. This goal can also be achieved by the investments in your economic development programming on the municipality side. Um, and then the third is accomplishing significant infrastructure projects. Um, there is often a, a sort of um, obstacle for developers and development that there's uh, significant infrastructure improvements that are necessary. And so as a result, infrastructure is often a, an approved project cost in development programs. Um, so if you already have a goal of, of making some significant infrastructure improvement, this can be a way to achieve that goal. And then the tax shift benefit is, is another component, which I, I will get to. I put it at the end because I think it's not quite as important in, in Scarborough. And, and will you be, I was going to say that, because Scarborough, we're already minimum receivers, so there's no yeah. shift benefit. So Yeah, there's a small yeah. one. And, and potentially, if um, it isn't always the case that you're a minimum receiver, right. it may be quite significant. So, yeah. and yeah, there, there are reasonable minds may that's, differ about, yeah. about whether that's likely, so, yes. Yeah, just a quick question, and you'll probably get into it, but when it says accomplish significant infrastructure projects, does that mean that money, that sheltered revenue, has to be used inside that specific TIF and for that specific project? So you're really, the developer is paying tax dollars in, but you're giving the tax dollars right. back to them right. so they can develop a project? 
So that is one possibility. Can you um, use it for other things? There, and we will get to okay. the categories. It, there is more flexibility than, than you explained there, but um, but sort of a, the, the purest example of a TIF is you need, a, you need infrastructure so that that project can get built. It's in the district. And so you use TIF revenues, whether the municipality undertakes the infrastructure project or the developer does, and you're reimbursing them through the credit enhancement agreement. In, in whatever way you do it, that the infrastructure project and the cost of that is what the TIF revenues is, are being used to. So the simple classic example is a development, uh, a vacant piece of land exists and you need public sewer uh, on the property to develop it significantly and the cost is exorbitant, it's a mile away. So there's any number of ways, town undertake it, we direct monies through the development program to pay the debt service or the developer undertakes it and we reimburse for that cost. Uh, got, that's kind of the simple classic example. There's all sorts of variations mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, but that's that's really the simplest one for an infrastructure project. Right. And the reason we would want, we may want to do that on occasion, is if that investment actually opens up additional land beyond that one specific project mm -hmm. too. So or even along a, that sewer line that ends at a point, mm -hmm. uh, this big vacant parcel, but it enables other parcels in between to Delete be developed. Block. So they're really case by case uh, in terms of the value and benefit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so uh, there are some statutory limits to TIF districts that are worth being aware of. Um, you do need in any TIF district to meet the requirement that at least 25% of the area has to be either blighted in need of rehabilitation, redevelopment, or conservation, or it must be suitable for commercial or arts district uses. Usually there is no problem with meeting this criteria because at least 25% and usually much more of a TIF district is suitable for commercial purposes, which is um, usually there's commercial development expected or possible there. Um, there are caps on the amount of acreage in your municipality that you can put into a single TIF district or in all your TIF districts. It's 2% for every single TIF district is the limit. 2% of your total town acreage, um, and it's a total of 5% in all TIF districts. Um, however, those caps do not apply to a couple of different very types of um, districts, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, the other cap is called the valuation cap. Um, that one relates to the original assessed value of a TIF district. The total of all the original assessed values of all your town's TIF districts can't be more than 5% of the total amount of value in the municipality. That is also not usually a concern because usually TIF districts have a low starting value. Um, and like I said, there are a couple of exceptions that, that, um, that help us out there. But it's good to just be aware of that. And then we've discussed the term limit, which is 30 years for any single TIF district. I don't anticipate uh, an issue with, it, with either the acreage or the value cap, given our, what I expect will be the proposal. Even if it encompasses the entire property, I guess, I don't expect it will be a, a barrier in either regard. Um, other relevant components of the statute that governs the process, if you're going to either amend a TIF district or put in place a new TIF district, um, there's a public hearing requirement and there's a 10-day public hearing notice ahead of that. Um, a lot of municipalities don't find the statutory requirements on the public process to be quite enough for what they like. They're, they're quite often public information sessions or something else that leads up to the public hearing also, just so people have uh, greater awareness. Um, and they often are doing something like this also leading up to a, a TIF district designation. Um, but according to the statute, you're, only, you're required to do a public notice, public hearing, and then a vote of the legislative body. Um, in this case, of course, that's the town council. Um, and you're voting to designate the district and adopt the development program for the district or amend it if that's what you're doing um, in that particular case. Um, you can have the public hearing and the vote on a district in the same evening. There's no prohibition on, on that. Um, and then following that process, the full application goes to the Department of Economic and Community Development or to the Director of Maine Housing if it's a housing, affordable housing TIF district. Development programs, what they call the principal document that 
describes the TIF? That's right, yes. And the statute prescribes various components of that document. Um, so some of it is not so wonderfully user-friendly for the local government, frankly. That, that I get that um, question a fair bit once you see a draft of these things, because we have to include some components. One of the things that we have to include is a set of projections of TIF revenue and the tax shift benefit, which we'll talk further about. And that, um, that can be useful information, of course, but it also needs to be qualified properly because we don't have a crystal ball. Um, I've talked a little bit about this, but the affordable housing TIF districts go to the Maine State Housing Authority for their review. Economic development TIF districts go to the Department of Economic and Community Development. They're very similar statutes, but um, they also differ in important ways in terms of how TIF revenues can be spent. Um, and the way I, in, in, for practical purposes, affordable <coughs> housing TIF districts are almost always um, focused on a particular project. Mm -hmm. um, economic development TIFs are much more flexible, and um, and I think that's where um, you can try and achieve some broader policy goals beyond beyond the particular project you're focused on. And then I wanted to talk about a couple of different types of economic development TIF districts. Um, we mentioned it before, but the, these top two, the downtown TIF and the transit-oriented TIF, those types of districts are exempt from the acreage cap and the value cap. Um, and part of the reason is because those districts are quite likely to be large in acreage and, and also in value. Um, a downtown TIF district, um, there are special requirements in order to be um, categorized that way. Uh, in addition to the development program document that a municipality is required to have for all TIF districts, a downtown TIF district is required to have a downtown redevelopment planning document that the municipality has adopted and that also needs to be submitted with the application for the district. Um, and the idea here is to ensure that you know you've really got a cohesive comprehensive plan because this is such a large area of the municipality um, at least that's the intention um, you also need to define your district boundary to actually meet the definition of downtown which i've put on the slide there the traditional business central business district of a community that has served as the center of socioeconomic interaction in the community, characterized by a cohesive core of commercial and mixed-use buildings, often interspersed with civic, religious, and residential buildings and public spaces that are typically arranged along a main street and intersecting side streets and served by public infrastructure. So it, there's a lot of words there, but there is some limit to how broadly you can define that. Um, but um, that does something to keep in mind. Yes? Uh, you have it in, in the past tense. It says, has served as the center of the town. Uh, would that eliminate uh, Scarborough Downs because it has not served as the center of the town? Well, I'll take that. <laughs> um, it depends on how it's how how the um, district is drawn. Boundaries. Right. So if you were going to make, if you were going to include part or all of Scarborough Downs in a traditional downtown TIF, you would have to, at a minimum, grab the municipal campus and other areas of Oak Hill. Okay. Um, and I think given the walkability, you know, there certainly are, there's a case to be made for that. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then uh, transit-oriented TIF districts are a relatively recent addition to the TIF statute. The concept that brought that into the um, the statute is that transit and economic development are sort of inextricably linked and so that there should be some acknowledgement in our economic development tool um, to, to that concept. And so um, there is greater flexibility to fund transit activities, newer ex expanded transit um, programs and services out of TIF <coughs> revenues um, for transit-oriented TIF districts. Um, you can also combine a downtown and a transit-oriented TIF. So if there are things that you want to, um, tra newer expanded transit services you want to fund out of a TIF district, then we should think about 
um, combining them and calling the district a transit-oriented district as well as a downtown district, uh, but they can also stand alone. Um, and then the last type that I've identified here is not a term you'll find in the statute, but DECD has sort of coined this term themselves. Um, and it's meant, omnibus TIF districts are meant to describe the scenario where you've got multiple lots or multiple parcels in the same district where you um, want to measure the increased assessed value, the captured assessed value by lot independent, uh, rather than take the original assessed value for the whole property and then um, the current assessed value of the whole property. Um, this facilitates individual um, credit enhancement agreements with pars with different parcels in the same district. Um, so do you have a question about yeah, this? Yeah, is that, is that determined by the tax map or can we identify a zone because uh, part of part of uh, Scarborough Downs is going to be done, I guess, in pods, if you will, in different sections. So, would that apply to uh, doing it? Is a requirement that it has to be a tax map, or what determines the individual parcel size? Um, well, so the omnibus TIF district as a concept is something we would just pick if we wanted it to be measured that way or not. Um, you can also draw a TIF district boundary to include parts of lots. You don't need to include a whole tax parcel. Um, it's usually um, your assessor would want you to pick a whole parcel. But there are occasions where that's just not um, optimal for some reason or possible if you, the lots haven't been drawn yet. So, um, so there's a lot of flexibility there. It just it ends up being difficult to measure what the the original assessed value is potentially and the current assessed value if you've got um, partial lots in the district. I, 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 sorry, I was just going to go ahead. But I'm just wondering if we, if we set, for example, an omnibus TIF for all of the property, but it's going to be developed over time if we parcel out different stages or phases as different individual partials. Does that make sense? I'm not sure I follow what the question is. It, it, it could, could we we could set that we could determine each phase could fall under a separate parcel so we could have something that's being developed let's say short term one to three years we could have a certain requirement in place for that um, and then the next phase comes in in three to five it wouldn't kick in or it wouldn't start or it would be a separate parcel yeah. I guess if you were so there there are a bunch of different ways you can do that you can create um, different TIF districts. Because right. um, then you could start the 30-year time frame at different times to coincide with when development's actually going to occur. And that will give you a little better idea of where to draw the boundaries if you wait a little bit um, longer. I mean, there, there are other options, too. If you wanted to designate um, you know, the whole area, including what Karen described in a downtown TIF district, um, then this, the 30-year clock starts for everything. But if you were to enter into agree credit enhancement agreements with respect to certain parcels or chunks of parcels, you can do that over time. And, and the omnibus district also allows the town to say, we are going to um, enter into credit enhancement agreements as we deem you know, appropriate over the course of the term of the TIF district, and we're not going to then have to go through the formal amendment process at the state level. We can, we're just going to handle that locally, yeah. and that's part of what the omnibus district right. is. Right, and so an example of that is, like, the town of Cumberland has a business park that they really wanted to promote, and they have it set up that um, it's an automatic 50% TIF if you locate here, but um, they'll do a separate credit enhancement agreement on a parcel-by-parcel -parcel basis. Hey, is there is there a way as as we look at these different structures, have you ever seen a TIF that has some type of clawback provision? Meaning, in mm -hmm. this particular case, I did some real estate development work. When the purchasers at this <coughs> property bought it, they ran pro proformers that probably said they project that even without a TIF, and we actually asked them the question, do you need a TIF to make this go? They said no. So they have done the pro forma, they know what their numbers are. If we now do a TIF where we are actually going to take taxpayers' dollars, mm -hmm. reinvest it into infrastructure, which is going to enrich their return, and I understand they may want to do that because of cash flow issues, mm -hmm. but can we recapture some of that value on the back end for taxpayers, or does it all go to the developer's pockets? 
Uh, so you're talking about a credit enhancement agreement where you you would somehow get the money paid back to you. Well, I mean, in this case, in this, yeah. in this case, if yeah. we if they have done a pro forma that assumes that they can carry the cost of the project and make a return, that's acceptable. Yeah. If we now enter a TIF, we're going to use taxpayers' dollars. Taxpayers will be paying more in taxes during this whole period, 30 years, where the money goes into the development. Yeah. That's going to enrich the developers, or they're going to sell the project, and it's going to enrich them. Mm -hmm. And where does that, can we return the value to taxpayers in some manner? Yeah, I mean, I think that part of the answer to that is at the time a credit enhancement agreement is entered into, um, you have to uh, weigh the costs and benefits for the taxpayers for your community. So if at that time um, you think they're going to, the, the overall development is going to be more successful or is going to be successful at all by entering into this agreement, it may be the right thing to do because it can promote jobs, it can have a multiplier effect on businesses around it. Um, but I think we are identifying a, a criticism of credit enhancement agreements generally, which is, you know, is this the, really the right choice? Is, are the taxpayers of the municipality getting enough benefit out of this con contract, out of this reimbursement um, as they need to um, in order for us to say, yes, we want to do this deal? Or do we just let them do their development? Um, we and get the benefits that way. Yeah, but but in terms of there there are some things you can do in credit enhancement agreements to incentivize certain types of behavior, and it's not terribly common, but there are definitely a number of credit enhancement agreements that have conditions on the reimbursement. So there's a condition, perhaps um, you know, by a certain year in the TIF term, the developer needs to hit a certain assessed value or increased assessed value, and then you know that you're going to. Um, have a, a financial benefit. I, I don't think I've said this before, but you don't need to capture 100% of the increased assessed value. So in that, that, what do you mean you don't have to? You, as you a municipality, you could, you could decide we're only going to capture 50% of the increased assessed value, what, which shelter, means, shelter that yeah, shelter, that. which means that 50% of the increased assessed value the taxes paid on that will go to the TIF fund, and 50% will go to the general fund. So in the theory of, of those sort of targets in credit enhancement agreements for value is if we get to $5 million of increased assessed value, that means the taxes paid on 2 and a half of it are going to go to the general fund, and we know we're going to get some um, public benefit out of that half, <coughs> and the other half will be reimbursement to the developer for whatever infrastructure projects or whatever you identify as the need to make the whole thing successful. And, and are any of those corridors regulated or is it just what you can negotiate with the developer? It's, it's a contract negotiated to be negotiated. So there are other TIF districts that, right, that try to create targets for job creation and can condition the reimbursement on some of these things. A lot of those conditions can make it very difficult for the developers to use them to obtain financing. I'll just say that. I know they're very, they're very unpopular with developers, but, um, but they exist right. um, and there are options. Right. So the, the state regulations don't require the town to you know, put penalties in, but it is up to the municipality to decide what to, what to put in, that, in the contract. But I just want to get back to the original um, question because it seemed like there were there were two versions of your of your question. If you're saying um, there's a company and they already they don't need any assistance, they're not asking for anything, um, any credit enhancement agreement. Right. But we're going to come in and put in the public infrastructure. Yeah. So is that the is is that what you're also asking? Um, there's no credit enhancement agreement, um, but we're publicly investing in the infrastructure. Well, I mean, specifically this case yeah. we're talking Scarborough Downs, and we yeah. sat here a month ago, yeah. I asked them if they assumed mm -hmm. that they were going to get any TIF monies from the community, and they said no. So they didn't assume when right. they did the acquisition, the development plan, their mm -hmm. purchase and development plan okay. didn't depend on TIF monies. Now mm -hmm. we're at the table saying we want to use taxpayers' revenue. Mm -hmm to help them develop the property. And I want to understand what's okay. in it for the taxpayers that they 
to trade off those revenues to help them develop, which mm -hmm. adds to their in value of their project. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand. I, yeah. I understand there are two different questions. If the project's yeah. going to go forward, there's no additional value to the town. So well, but there could be. Yeah. If their project could go forward on a 25-year build-out scenario, the performer works. But we think, let's get there at 15. And what can we do? Is it our? It may be in our best interest to incentivize by way of uh, credit yeah, enhancement agreement to get them quicker to the end. Right. Yeah, but that should be an analysis. We should be able to do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Because Absolutely. You, might, you might limit the, the uh, agreement to 15 years. So as soon as the agreement's over, right. the total value that's been developed goes on to right. the general fund. Right. right. And I guess it, it's important to note here that we're talking about value that doesn't exist today. Now, this, this is value that currently isn't in, in our tax base. Um, now, if there are impacts that come with development that have a cost to us, that's part of the conversation as well. But this is about future value that doesn't exist. And this, the, in the purest form, it would be the but-for argument that we won't, we, we can't make this project happen but for this assistance. And but that, it will that's never what they said. They, they, right. said, they right. said they could do it without our assistance. Right. So the only value to us would be if this makes it go faster and we get enough value from that. Faster or they do something that we want that they don't really have to, that they didn't need to do in their development plan. So there's a bunch, there's a, a and the several and different types of, of um, well, so. pieces. And, and that's one of the reasons I'm trying not to, get too far ahead. They, they need to tell, whoever comes forward, they need to tell us what they want and why they want it. Uh, that's fundamental. And then that's when our analysis starts. What, what's in it for us and how do we benefit? Shani, the, the three types, uh, the economic development tip has to be one of those three? No. no. Or you can, can have just sort of the standard economic development. So these are only the specialty ones exactly. under the economic development. Exactly. And are these kind of uh, how popular or common are these? Are we sort of off, sort of over here, talking about stuff that's probably not likely to happen? Uh, or are these mainstream, the most popular ways in which it goes? Um, so the, there are many more TIF districts that don't <coughs> fall in these categories than do, because you can only have one downtown district in any municipality and transit oriented districts are relatively recent and just investment in transit is not terribly popular in certain parts of the state anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, but there are a lot of municipalities taking advantage of the of those two types and, and omnibus districts are also um, increasing in popularity just simply because there are more districts that are area wide um, that encompass more than one parcel. So there's maybe advantages to these as opposed to a general economic development tip that would gravitate you towards right, the, yes. using one of these? The cap limits don't exist in certain cases. So yeah, there might okay. be good and reasons. So you might be able to make the case. Right. And the downtown has a little bit more flexibility on a couple of issues. Yeah, so, so that's a good point, Karen. I'm happy to talk about there's an additional advantage of a downtown TIF district that um, is fairly limited. but. Um, to the extent you have uh, TIF districts that are not your downtown district, but you can make an argument, the statutory language is that that development in those other districts is somehow detrimental to the focus on economic development in the downtown district. There's some adverse impact that needs to be mitigated. That there are occasions where you can use TIF revenue from another TIF district to support the development program project costs of your downtown TIF district. And it's limited, but it exists, and there are some municipalities that are using that to a tremendous advantage because they've got development that's really significant in some outlying TIF district, and their downtown hasn't really generated a whole lot of increased assessed value, but that's where they have all the investment that they want to do. Um, so that's something to consider. I think also we, we thought it was important to highlight it just because you don't have a downtown TIF district, um, and so it's, it's certainly still an option for you, and you're talking about a lot of potential development over time here, and that can, over time, create a problem for your, your acreage cap and your value cap. Now let's not get caught up in all the unique specialty details. And it just occurred to me, implicit in my mind, but maybe not obvious to everyone, we shouldn't ever be even be talking, having this conversation if it doesn't first and foremost make sense to us. Mm -hmm. It right. obviously makes sense right. to the private developer. Right. Oh, yeah. um, and so that's the first question we need to 
ask ourselves an answer before we go go past it. So um, I, I see heads nodding. So I guess you, yeah. you do get that point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I won't spend much time on this because I think um, yeah, I think this local council knows about affordable yeah. housing districts, yeah. and that's how. So credit enhancement agreements, we've talked about this. I mean, it's worth making the point following from the recent conversation that um, you, you may decide to enter into, or to designate a TIF district where there is no contemplated credit enhancement agreement and you're really creating a vehicle to invest in certain economic development projects through the increased assessed value of a particular area. Um, and so I just thought it was worth highlighting that while there are almost 500 TIF districts in the state of Maine, only about half of those districts even have a credit enhancement agreement associated with it, um, which is often surprising to people. But a, a lot of the work I do is for municipalities who are creating TIF districts that are meant to fund their own infrastructure. They see a development coming in and they want to finance or fund a certain project. Um, or a set of projects that happen to meet the statutory requirements of project costs. Any so, questions about so that? So why, why do people have credit enhancement agreements as a part of their TIF? If they have a developer that comes forward with a proposal and they make some compelling argument that it's better for the town to incentivize that development to happen, to, as Karen said, perhaps get something out of that development they wouldn't otherwise get that's benefiting to the community, or making a development happen faster. There's a lot of benefits that could come to a municipality from agreeing to provide a reimbursement on property taxes over time. The, the other part of the question is why do half the TIFs don't have yeah. credit oh, okay. answer? It's yeah. because there are significant shelter tax shelter benefits and also a way to designate future tax revenue that doesn't exist today toward qualified programs whether it's infrastructure right. economic development initiatives um, and so that's done unilaterally um, without the involvement or even the knowledge of sometimes of the developer it happens we choose to do that for our own reasons not for theirs right. The other piece that's important to know is you can have a TIF without a credit enhancement agreement, but you cannot have a credit enhancement Blue agreement without a TIF. The right. TIF sets the structure of why you're investing in this property to begin with, and here are all the things that um, you expect to happen. So um, you can't have one without the other. So the deal with the developer is the credit enhancement agreement. Correct. Correct. And sometimes it's that, you know, we may, there may be a piece of, of public infrastructure that we want them to pay for that's not really on their side but let them pay for it and we'll pay them back through the credit enhancement agreement so now I was going to move into how TIF revenues can be spent under the TIF statute and they're really um, the statute breaks the co project costs up into three categories one um, is the project costs that are located inside the TIF district. So if you draw your TIF district around an area, the capital costs that are inside that TIF district are pretty easy to get approved as an approvable project cost in your development program. Um, the, the second category are project costs that are outside the TIF district but are, quote, directly related to or made necessary by the TIF district. So the idea here is even if you don't include um, in your TIF district area the, the intersection that needs a major improvement, um, but that intersection it, improvement is required because of the development that's in the district, that intersection improvement will qualify as a project cost. Yeah, another example is upgrading pump stations. You know, downstream of the project, it's not in the area, but the development and the flow that comes from it requires upgrades of the system down below. Are there any like geographical limits? Does it have to be adjacent, or could it be anywhere in town? That it's going to be directly related or made necessary necessary by. Right. But I'm going to say, so let's say again, using um, Scarborough Downs as an example, if we need to upgrade an intersection at Payne Road and uh, you know, farther down Payne Road towards the mall because of the increased traffic flow. Sure. Mm -hmm. That that would count. It doesn't need to be adjacent to or within. No, a if it could be justified, okay. it could be across town. If there are demonstrable <coughs> impacts that can be tied to that project, I think you could make it qualify. It sounds like these have to be approved by the state. 
Yeah, so yes. this is the process where they, they have the final say on whether we meet the statute, whether our development program project list meets the statute. So the process in effect is as we're developing that list, if we're moving forward with a hypothetical development program, we're gonna I'm gonna make sure that the state is on board with anything that might be on the edges of whether it meets directly related to or made necessary by. I think the proximity question, as you get farther away, it's a little harder to make that case, potentially, but you certainly can. So th this is an ongoing process. The TIF might say, we need a pumping station down the road, and so we want to, and so we would go to the state. The state would either say yay or nay. No, it's not an ongoing process in that way. At the time the town approves the, uh, designates the district and adopts the development program, inside the development program will be a project list. <coughs> and that project list will need to be comprehensive. I try to describe those projects as broadly as I can because it's very hard to predict all the things that mm -hmm. you might want to do with the TIF revenues. But the state is going to have some restrictions about how specific you are um, in that project list. How about number three? Yeah, so there is a third category, and it's often surprising what falls into it, but project costs, they are unrelated to the location of the TIF district. It's not totally unlimited. There, there are subsections of that section of the statute that outline what could go in it. Um, and you know, there are a few examples are um, environmental improvements that are made necessary by or, or are related to economic development. Municipality. So you can put a TIF district in place and have some environmental project the town has to undertake in a completely different area of your town. But if you can make the case that that environmental improvement is necessary to facilitate development or to deal with the effects of development, then you can have that be uh, part of your development program project list. Does that make sense? Um, some of the other things in that category include you know, funding your economic development staff, um, funding um, programs you might have for your business community, um, a lot of sort of general economic development program costs um, are included there. Um, transit costs are also in included in that category. So, it, you, so some of the transit costs don't have to be directly related to the TIF district boundaries. Um, and I can talk about some other things as well. There, there's um, child care costs. It's a very seldom used option in this category. Um, skills development and job training programs are in this category. Also, um, revolving loan funds for um, businesses. Um, there are some municipalities that have revolving loan funds, investment funds, or grants for local businesses that are funded through TIFs. Yes. So Karen will like this because we've talked about it. So does that mean if we wanted to fund an economic development loan program for micro businesses, we could actually include that as part of yeah. something like the soccer mm -hmm. for economic uh, mm -hmm. fund? That's right. And, and that could be completely unrelated to the original project. That's right. Percent. It can come from any TIF district anywhere in the, in the town. Uh, so yeah. Um, there is uh, a limit. <laughs> there is a statute. <laughs> There's a provision of the statute that talks about um, sort of the limits here, and that the goal is really not to fund your general governmental core things through a TIF district. And so um, there's an exception. You can't fund your town hall, your your jails, recreation centers, athletic centers, swimming pools. There's um, there's some things we'll have to address there based on what your goals might be, but um, but it's useful to know that. Can that be part? Of, that can't be part of a credit enhancement agreement. Um, no, 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 even no. through Completely a credit excluded. enhancement agreement. Okay. So so credit enhancement agreement. Um, Actually, the, the first category of those three projects, project cost categories, is uh, project costs that are located inside the TIF district. Credit enhancement agreements generally fit in that category because you're reimbursing future property taxes to the developer of the capital and capital building. I mean, the building itself, so not municipal capital, but the private capital imp improvement is being um, 
funded through the TIF and the credit enhancement agreement. So that's sort of how those qualify. It doesn't relate to those items. A lot of people at home watching that and sighing because of that last bullet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people sitting at this table are saying <laughs> Just a, a, a little footnote. Yeah. Um, I will mention um, many of these are kind of so-called loopholes that have been closed up over the years. Uh, I believe Scarborough, uh, this building that we're sitting in, is uh, was the last town hall that was funded. It was the now defunct town center TIF that right. encompassed okay. Oak Hill area. And at the time, it was allowed through the TIF statute. And so a portion of this building was funded through, um, through the TIF program. And they quickly closed that loophole uh, back in 91 or 2. Sean, I don't see uh, uh, fire departments or police departments up there. Yeah, so so in the second category where I said made necessary by or directly related to, um, oh. there are some um, public safety improvements and investments that can be funded through TIF revenues if that development is creating the need for those improvements or investments. Mm. and so. Um, you know, an additional fire truck or a ladder truck instead of a regular truck, um, those kinds of things can be in it. E even a portion of the costs of a new fire station at times it qualifies. Can schools be funded? Schools no. are not, um, yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not an option. However, in the um, affordable housing right. statute, there is a provision for that given that affordable okay. housing projects usually encompass. Additional schools, but so there is the one small loophole on leasing, um, yes, within the downtown. Yes, um, yes. I don't think she wanted you to. Mention oh, sorry, that man. We didn't get our story straight <laughs> no. before. We're acutely aware of yeah. community interest and needs, and uh, we're scouring the statute to find creative ways to perhaps um, advance some of those um, ideas. And it's going to be exceedingly difficult, but it's worth pursuing. So yeah, I think it's I premature to answer that question, but there's some angles we're pursuing. Good. Just for, for background, Keep the, noodling. the provision actually that, that Karen is referring to, so, and, it's, and I don't know of any actual use in real time and real life of this, but it's the cost of facilities leased by state government or a municipal government that are located in downtown TIF districts. There would have to have been some specific reason that particular provision is in there, an option is in there, but I don't, I'm not aware of what it is. And so that's one of the things we'll, we'll keep pressing on and investigating. Um, so next slide is just about how you might fund project costs. So if you're thinking about an, an, um, an infrastructure improvement, um, how might you fund it, um, practically speaking? So one of the ways is through a credit enhancement agreement where the developer actually um, undertakes the improvement itself, um, undertakes the uh, project to improve the intersection or whatever it may be, and then over time the town agrees to reimburse for those costs um, through a credit enhancement agreement. Uh, another option is through municipal bonds. So you can issue a municipal bond to pay for an infrastructure improvement and simply, rather than using your general fund dollars to make those debt service payments, you use your TIF um, funds as they're available to repay the debt service. And then um, just setting aside TIF revenues over time in your TIF um, fund, um, then you are able to apply those on, as they're available to capital improvements. Thinking of these options, this council will recall uh, the property on uh, Running Hill Road on the other side of Route 95. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it requires public sewer to, to be developed yeah. in any significant way. Uh, that's a huge cost. It's a uh, three or four million dollar cost. The number escapes me, uh, which the owner of some of most of the property has indicated that's, a, that's more than he can bear. So there's you know, there's any number of ways to, to do that. We could, pay for it ourselves and pay back with TIF revenues, or I always prefer using their money and letting them assume mm -hmm. the risk. Right. And depending on performance of the, of the TIF area, they get their money. Um, so that's that's the preferable approach from my perspective, is mm -hmm. to let the developer make the investment and agree to re reimburse them over time. So now the, the last topic I'm going to address, um, and then Karen will get to 
talk about the existing districts in Scarborough is the tax shift benefit. And I know um, a number of you are familiar with this, so bear with me as I review it, because I think it helps to just frame it every time. Um, but the tax shift benefit um, is based on the way in which state education subsidy, county taxes, and revenue sharing subsidies are calculated at the state level. And those formulas are all based, at least in part, on every municipality's state valuation. And the state valuation is um, the equalized total assessed value in a municipality. Um, so it's a little bit old because um, the, the equalization process at the state takes a couple of years to make sure that all the municipalities are assessing real estate. Um, it, it's sort of different assessment ratios, but they need a little bit of time to make sure everyone's state valuation is, is comparable um, and, and that they can um, base those calculations of subsidies and county taxes on something um, that can be compared across municipalities. But it's your total value in your municipality is supposed to drive how much subsidy you receive and how much county tax you pay. And the theory being that as you have more value in your municipality, you should be able to pay more for the education um, of kids in Scarborough than you otherwise would, and everything else as well, based on revenue sharing subsidies, and you can pay more in county tax. That's th the theory of each of those um, formulas. So um, what I like to how I like to talk about tax shift benefit, and don't get excited by this slide, mm -hmm. this is sort of if the town is not a minimum receiver, which you are. So. But, um, but I run these calculations for every municipality who's interested in, in learning about this, because at a given point, um, there are a bunch of other things that go into those formulas too. So for every new tax dollar you receive in Scarborough from a new development, there's some percentage of that tax dollar that's gonna be lost to these tax shifts. You don't get the full benefit of, of new tax revenue because you're going to lose subsidy and have to pay more county tax. Um, I usually run these calculations um, based on your state aid to education impact, your county tax impact, and your revenue sharing impact. Um, and in Scarborough, if you were to not be considered a minimum receiver, um, obviously your education impact is significant. Um, that, mean, that means that for every new tax dollar that's paid on new development, that in fact 49.9%, um, according to the current formulas, is lost to um, state aid to education um, reduction. Now, let's just talk to, I mean, you may all know exactly what minimum receiver status means, but it's essentially if you um, are not, you have to receive, according to state law, a minimum amount of subsidy in relation to your special education costs as they define them. So if you are already having a bump up in your subsidy because of your high um, special education costs in comparison to what your subsidy otherwise would be, you're considered a minimum receiver. Therefore, there is no tax shift impact based on your valuation any longer. And that's what we're seeing here in Scarborough. It's relatively recent that that's been the case. Um, and I know that some folks feel like that's probably going to be um, your world you live in for a long time. In which case, um, this ne next slide is a more realistic representation of the tax shift in Scarborough. Now, how this impacts TIFs is worth just playing all the way through. Captured. Um, increased assessed value, capture value in a TIF district is invisible to the state valuation. Therefore, for TIF revenue, you enjoy the full dollar. You don't enjoy only 94.5% of it. So there is a financial incentive for municipalities to pay for project costs that they know they would otherwise pay for out of their general fund through a TIF. Um, and that's an important concept to understand. In Scarborough, it's a little unique because you've got this minimum receiver issue. Um, and, and the lion's share, obviously, of this impact is for education subsidy costs. Any questions about that? How important is this factor to municipalities that are not minimum receivers to enter into a TIF agreement? 
So to enter into a TIF or to do a TIF district on its own without a, I mean, a credit enhancement agreement or a municipal TIF with no credit enhancement agreement is hugely important. Yeah. Um, I give this talk, as I said, to, to municipalities all over the state, and there's this light bulb moment when they realize yeah. the financial impact of these things. And they realize, hey, you know what? We're investing in economic development right now. We're doing yeah. it through a general fund. We should be doing it through a TIF district and taking advantage of this program the way other communities are. So that, that's definitely what I see. It's really a huge factor. An example you know, would be um, New Gloucester, when Pineland first came on board and was going to develop, the developers of Pineland wanted nothing to do with a TIF, but the town wanted to do it to protect all that new value that was going to come online and to really right. um, do the, the tax shift. Um, so that's why they did that. Yeah, and in Scarborough's case, you know, I, I've often said we're a victim of our own success. You know, yeah. Our development growth, certainly relative to almost every other community in the state, is, is really astounding. And you see we've been on the losing end of that, uh, getting at best half of the new dollar. And I guess the worst part of that is propelling us toward minimal receivership. Incidentally, New Gloucester is amending that district right now in order yeah. to help them fund a portion of the cost of their new public works facility, which will serve Pineland. So, uh, so is it fair to say then that the, the TIF is really set up for the, 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 the idea of the town's benefit, but a credit enhancement agreement would be would be more towards the with the eye towards the developer side of it. So we could do a TIF whether whether we use credit enhancement agreements for, exactly. for development or not. But I think there are some credit enhancement agreements that definitely benefit the town as well. Oh, I'm not, I'm yeah, not saying so that. Can, I'm, just, can, I'm just saying, both you know, ways. I think when most people hear the word yeah. TIF, they think immediately it's paid back to a developer. Yeah. yeah. And I, I just want to make sure I understand Absolutely. a TIF could yeah. be structured to be a, a very large benefit for the town Absolutely. without anything to do with a developer. Exactly. Right. And in fact, half of them in existence, that's exactly yeah. the case. Okay. So I'm going to turn things over to Karen. Okay. Thank you. Tom, would you mind starting there? There are two sets of fact sheets here um, that give you some of the details of the existing uh, tips, and I'm going to try to go through yeah, a couple we, of highlights. We have about 10 minutes. Okay. I'm going to go quickly through some highlights. <laughs> well, just we need a little time to switch over. And, um, and I can continue to answer questions if anybody uh, has any about the, the specific tips. But let's see if we can at least give some highlights of where we are. So from an economic development tip standpoint, we have three tips right now. One of them is for Inter Enterprise Business Park. One of them is for um, the BO, it's called the BOR slash Elevation Center. Some people think of it as Foundation Center, which I think is ultimately uh, what they originally called it. And then there's the highest part of the So in all three of those uh, TIFs, we do have a credit enhancement agreement. It's only in the highest Parkway to, oh. I'm sorry, where, where's the BOR? That is right, that's where Science oh, Park Road, um, it's the former uh, Conica building. Oh, okay. Uh, for, for Coastal yeah. Women's Health. Yeah. Got it. Yes. So BOR is just, just the name of the zone that just happened to be in the official submission. So trying to stay true to that. Um, so again, there are three different tips, and they all look very different. Um, uh, Enterprise Business Park is 83 acres. The Elevation Center is very specific, and it's only the six acres of the actual uh, site. And that tip actually is for redevelopment. So there was an existing building, whereas Enterprise Business Park and Haigas Parkway are really, um, that's all new development that's going to happen. So Haigas Parkway, 375 acres are actually contained in the tip that it was approved by the state. Um, again, they are all running, um, Enterprise Business Park runs to 2022, um, Elevation Center runs to 2025, that's the newest one, and then Haigas Parkway runs to 2028. And so let's take a look at Enterprise Business Park first off. Um, again, there is a credit enhancement agreement. It was for public improvements, and I think I list them more specifically um, in, the, in the fact sheets there. There's no separate public program. So the only thing we're doing is reimbursing the developer for some of the uh, public improvements. The original obligation in that TIF is $1.5 million 
To date, we've reimbursed um, 1.32 million, so there's a balance of about $179,000. Based on where they are now and how much value has been created, you know, I, we're estimating, based on 2018, that we would be done in fiscal year 2020. In this TIF, there was some variation in the early parts of the TIF about how much was going to the credit enhancement agreement versus how much was going to be retained by the general fund. Um, but at this point, we are at 50-50 split. So the new value that was created was $12.8 million to date. The taxes generated from that are split, 50% going towards paying back the credit enhancement agreement, 50% going back into the general fund. So, and that's because, again, we didn't have a separate public improvement program. Uh, we only had the credit enhancement agreement. And again, we did try to look back um, to see what has happened in these TIF districts. And my estimate going through um, uh, business by business is we're somewhere around 200 new jobs and there's still a great deal of potential build out available at the Enterprise <coughs> Business Park. On Elevation Center, again, there was a credit enhancement agreement specifically for um, some infrastructure improvements and I believe I've got them listed there. They rebuilt Science Park Road. They did um, a few other types of, of infrastructure investments. We agreed to reimburse them $559,000. To date, we've reimbursed about $150,000. So we've got a balance of $400,000, $409,000. It's to be completed in fiscal year 2025. At this point, and none of the, um, it's at 100%, so 100% of the taxes generated are going to pay for the credit enhancement agreement. The captured value so far, the net new value that's been created is 1.5 million. There's been about 150 jobs estimated um, that have, that have um, resulted as investment in this property. So the one thing that I think you know, Tom pointed out is um, we probably are, if you just kept that value at um, where we were in 2018, uh, by the end of this TIF, we won't be paying out the full $409,000. Uh, and that's, you know, that's something that, um, you know, we can certainly look at, but that's the risk that, that the developer took as well. Just let me point out, I, I do recall this very uh, specifically. This project came forward in 2011, uh, really in the depths of the, the recession. And I know the council at the time was very excited to see anyone willing to uh, undertake a project of this size, and particularly a, a redevelopment of a, a building that was in, in, Vacant for three years. in great need. So there was some kind of compelling public benefit to offer some assistance. And I think this is truly a case where this project would not have gone forward but for um, right. Our assistance. So, if I can understand it correctly, that the you say the balance of 409 uh, is that existing funds, or is that what needs still needs to be paid in to satisfy? That's that's to satisfy the assumed full payout. Right. Uh, but so, it's underperforming, so, and, and at this point, won't ever uh, be able to fully perform. But my point is, there's not 409 sitting in an account somewhere, and no. it's TIF that comes back. I just want to be no. clear. That, no. okay. And and just you know, no. uh, again, a reminder that nothing gets paid out until it's paid in. So if the value doesn't get created, and the um, land hasn't generated that the taxes, and the developer hasn't paid the taxes, nothing. Right. Nothing so goes the, out. the the TIF creates value. It generates uh, taxes. The tax money goes into a fund, and then under the credit enhancement agreement, the fund will pay out to the developer monies as they're available. Exactly. And so far, we've paid out uh, 150000 Correct. Uh, and given that we've only gotten a $1.5 million increase in assessed value, the captured value, yeah. it really doesn't look like that's twenty grand. Right. Tax rate of 15 whatever. Right. So that you're, it's going to be, you're never going to get there by 2025. Right. What happens at the end of 2025? If the, the tip goes away, 
Yeah. Um, unless there's some amendment or, um, you know, there are a lot of things that you can, you can decide to change. Um, but technically at this point it, it ends and that those um, revenues come back to the general fund. So it's, it was structured as a cap, not, I mean, certainly when the, that was entered into, it was the developer's hope and expectation that they would get to the, um, to the full 559000 in reimbursed funds. But the way the contract is written, it's a cap on the total amount of reimbursement. So if they had done... Um, if there had been more captured value generated and you reached that 559 by this date, there would have been an automatic termination of the reimbursement Correct. under the credit yes. handling. So in this case, what will happen instead is in 2025, the um, or whenever the, the term of the credit enhancement agreement mm -hmm. is done and the credit and the TIF district expires, they will not have reached 559 and the town's obligation is gone at whatever amount they received by that time. So a credit enhancement agreement cannot exceed the duration of the TIF? Correct. Correct. But is the inverse true? If, if for whatever reason they were to rapidly catch up and have paid off, you know, we were to um, reimburse them the full for mm -hmm. nine remaining in 2020, let's say, yep. would then the TIF, TIF district end or is it just the credit mm -hmm. enhancement agreement that goes away? Well, in this case, right, know. two two ways. Um, one, you can um, end the tip district, um, or you could amend the the program if you had other expenses or other things that you wanted to do within that uh, that district. This being a specific property, that's probably not going to happen. But um, I mean, under the documents as they are now, unless the council were to decide mm -hmm. to amend it. The district would terminate right. along with the credit enhancement agreement. But that's dependent on how the how it's written. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so we, you know, at any point in time, you can amend a, a district as something comes up. Uh, you want to add more. Um, there are other items that the town has decided is important to them, and they want to amend the the program, the development program that you originally filed. That can be amended at any time. So this actually caused me to ask a question about the previous, so I yeah. apologize for sure. that. That's right. This is obviously completely built out. The potential growth on, on the Enterprise Park, does that 35% include the approved uh, residential piece at the end of the park, or does it exclude it? it? That's not built, so there's... Even though it's been approved to be built, it doesn't include it? Well, it, it includes the territory, but there's no value there yet. Okay. So... Well, this is potential growth yeah. so built up. It's, there's significant uh, potential yeah. value um, yet to be um, delivered by Enterprise Business Park. Um, there's a lot of growth. There's a lot of growth potential there. All right. So let's go back to the Heights Parkway. So we'll this is the. I'm sorry, what? You saved the easy one for last. I did. I wanted to get to the easy ones. So Haggis Parkway has both a program of public investment that the municipality in, um, undertook, and then it's got a separate credit enhancement agreement that is for a subsection of uh, the TIF, a subsection of the geographic area. So under the public development program, which basically... To simplify it, um, it's all areas of the Haggis Parkway except for what we know as gateway shops and then the new um, gateway commons. The gateway commons, and it was formerly known as Gateway Square. So those two pieces of property um, are really what the, the subject of the credit enhancement agreement is. So under the public section of the TIF, the public program, they would capture about $9.1 million, and that would include things like um, Horizon Solutions, um, the Salt Pump Climbing Company, those types of, of uh, developments are, are captured under this TIP. And the revenues to date is just under a million dollars. We've been generating, in 2018, $151,000 a year. So. Yes, that's less than what I think the original tip anticipated. Um, so we, if I understand it, the public development side, we invested as a town upfront in that infrastructure extension, 
What was the value of that investment? I believe that was about eight million for the um, principal of the investment. Yeah, I think it's a little more than that. And yeah. essentially, half of that investment was intended to be captured through this vehicle. Okay. We also have sewer assessments that apply on a front mm -hmm. foot basis to those properties on Haggis Parkway, which mm -hmm. is also intended to cover that uh, debt service. So, if we if this TIF were to uh, expire the public development program would also expire with it. So it would be, if we wanted to continue to retry and recapture that $4 million that we wanted through this program, we would be in our best interest to extend, it, to extend that TIF, correct? Right. I don't think we have many more years. Yeah. Right. I think we're at 25 years. I have to, have to go back. Yeah. I, we have a few more years. So then on the credit enhancement agreement side, um, the stated purpose in the credit enhancement agreement um, really was to offset some uh, development costs for Gateway Square and Gateway Shops. Um, part of that was some um, investment in the infrastructure, but the credit enhancement agreement was um, broad in terms of um, what the money could be spent for. The original obligation capped out at 8.25 million over the life of the TIF. It also has an annual cap of $825,000. So if this property subject to the credit enhancement agreement generates more than $850,000 on a yearly basis, that's capped by the municipality. Um, so 825,000 annual cap, 8.25 million in total revenues uh, promised. The amount paid to date is 4.76 million. So that leaves us around 3.48 million dollars left on this tip. The amount that was reimbursed in 2018 was just under 500,000. And I think that fluctuates a little on a year to year basis, but in 2018 it was 500,000. 492 if you want to be specific. So in the capture value or the new value generated, um, right now under this TIF it was $29 million uh, of new value. So if we base this on what was generated in 2018, um, we would be completed with this in seven years. We do anticipate that there's new value coming online um, with the uh, apartments that are going in. Um, that should significantly, or hopefully, uh, noticeably reduce the number of years required because new value is going to be um, generated. So that is the and those are, that's bonded money that we put out. Yes, for the for the infrastructure for, the infrastructure. for uh, both public development program and the New England expedition. No, we didn't bond anything for New England expedition. That's on them. That's the private investment yeah. that we're reimbursing them for. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So I think, you know, this is a lightly a light overview of what these uh, the tips have done. I think the important piece here is they're extremely flexible tools, and it's about us um, using them to benefit the town in a very strategic way. Do you know offhand how many affordable housing uh, tip districts we have? Is it, is it just Southgate, or do we also have? Just it's not Bessie Commons as well. Yes, it's uh, Bessie Commons. Like yes. uh, yeah, there's two. Yeah, there's two. Okay. And we have another one there. That's no longer relevant. Are right. Other yeah. questions to Karen? Very good. Thank, Thank you, Karen. Both of you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Thank and you. I'm happy to answer. I actually understood like Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to give you more information on the fact sheets. I'm happy to answer any questions at any time. Because it is, believe me, I've looked through these documents a number of times. It's complicated. Yeah. Thanks. We'll reconvene in about two minutes. Can we have a good lady? But you can fall out the bathroom break. <laughs> <laughs>